Well, last time Pastor Adam Kuntz and I got together to talk about Ezekiel, we got through some of chapter three. We ended up talking quite a bit about the challenge of being a Christian in a world of people who don't want to hear what you have to say and how Ezekiel being made a bit of a hard head can help us as we face what the loved ones even who, who don't believe. There was something he said last time that I want to start us off with today. We may get into chapter three and four again of Ezekiel, but this may just end up be being more of a raw digression. He, he said, I think the Benedict option is thoroughly unbiblical. And I, Adam, I found that really interesting as a statement. As a person who myself is not really familiar with the book, I've not read the book, but I do know that there's a lot of Lutherans who I respect who like the book, The Benedict Option, and what it purports to be the necessary steps that Christians are going to have to take in an increasingly aggressively pagan world. And so I, I'm curious first to if you would take some time to define the Bene Benedict Option, talk about the book, the idea, and then without, if you can, without uh, um, deconstructing it right. too much. Because I'd like to hear it and then be able to form an opinion about it. And then you can tell me why I'm wrong after that, <laughs> uh, if I happen to like it. Yeah. yeah? So can we start Can we yeah. start there? What, what is the Benedict Option? The, what is the, that? The Benedict about? Option is a book and a project, a potential project, uh, both by Rod Dreher, um, who has been a journalist of varying um, Christian stripes, for a long time. Um, he used to work for National Review. Um, he now writes for the American Conservative, and that has its own links um, to the conservative political world, especially the kind of ideological, not necessarily electoral world um, that I worked in before I was a pastor. So if you want to talk about that, we can also do that because I see the Benedict Option as having a particular political direction. Um, and so well, why, why don't you, just, why don't you just define what you mean by that? You're, you're talking about like conservative think tank, preserve the constitution, preserve Western civilization. Yes, all, all, all the thing? options on the right since the 1960s that have reacted to the concurrent massive change in American society, um, politics and acceptable thought since the 1960s. And that that's not just something that's happening randomly, but there are organizations and people actively trying to to push a good worldview, perhaps. But yeah, on the right, yeah. on the right and the left, I think one of the okay. So let's just describe the Benedict Option, and then I'll go into this because I'm already yeah. All right. I don't. I I, I want to describe it. Um, is that Dreyer sees small communities of Christians, um opting out of mainstream society in order to preserve the faith for future generations. And the reference in Benedict is to Benedict of Nursia, um, a monk in, I want to say the sixth century, maybe the seventh century, uh, who built a monastery at Monte Cassino in Italy. And um, the, the, the historical metaphor that Dreyer's working with is that the monks did that as the Roman Empire in the, he, he doesn't actually specify, he just says the Roman Empire, but it, it's really just the West collapsed. And uh, they preserved both Christianity and Western civilization uh, through their educational activities, through their distinctive way of life. And Dreyer describes that in the book, but he also describes um, communities that he sees doing that in contemporary America, the one that sticks out to me as a uh, Latin mass Roman Catholic community uh, that settled um, on a lot of um, contiguous land in Oklahoma. So, um, you get that with some some Benedict option type places um, that if you're in this conservative thought world are, are generally very familiar would be um, sometimes people name Hillsdale in here, but um, I think much more intensively would be Christendom College in Virginia and Wyoming Catholic College in Wyoming. Um, they have very distinctive visions and are usually committed to the Latin, um, to the, the Tridentine Mass. Um, you, you have things like this in non-Roman Catholic communions. Um, and Dreyer describes some of those, but I think it, the project is most advanced among Roman Catholics simply because of numbers. 
Um, there's just so many Roman Catholics, you get many more instances of alternative communities. Obviously, also, um, people engaged in this project would be the Amish on a massive scale, um, and they have doubled their numbers since the 1970s, largely through procreation, but also because they have a 90% retention rate for kids that grow up in the Amish church, remain Amish when they're adults. And so that Benedict option is what is something that Dreyer identifies both in the past of the West and of the Western church. And he sees as the hope for sanity and um, some kind of reconstructive project in the future of the Western church, especially in America. So, okay. So the idea is civilizational reclusion. Yeah. 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 There, there's a definite opting out that has to take place a kind of, you know, and I, I don't say this pejoratively, a retreat that has to take place so that life can be preserved in the same way that, you know, if I want to keep my plants alive during the winter, I need to bring them inside. And that's not natural. That's not necessarily what a plant might want to do is to, you know, live in my kitchen. Uh, it wants to live outside, but for it to survive the winter, I have to bring it inside at least for a time. There's, there's a couple pieces that I want to touch on. I'm going to bounce off like three things and then come back to right where yeah. we are. So you don't have to follow up on any of this stuff. You mentioned the collapse of the Roman empire and you said, well, it's really just right. the West and see, that's a loaded, that's a loaded term. So for the, for the listener, there were the Roman empire under Constantine mm -hmm. was divided, right? was divided in half because it was too big for one man to manage. The emperor's like, I can't do all this. So he split it in half, a Western and an Eastern Roman empire puts the Eastern capital in Constantinople, mm -hmm. right? Which later becomes Istanbul. You can ask the, they might be giants about how all that happened. And then, <laughs> um, uh, and then in Rome, uh, I forget who gets put in charge of Rome, but he goes, he goes East and rules from the East side. And so you have these two empires that are one beside each other. And while the West will end up over being overrun by, by mm -hmm. paganism, uh, the, the, the Germans and whatnot, proto Germans, uh, the East survives longer even though it also gets a little taken over by, by Islam eventually, but still kind of retains more of its civilizational yeah. flavor than the West yeah. does. Right. And, and so, so just the Western there, the West, he means uh, Western Roman empire of that era, not what we would call the West today. Although to some extent, that's where that terminology it still is. comes from. We're yes. not talking about the West as U S and the East as China, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> uh, the dividing line is, is the Roman empire. So you, we, you can chase that if you want to B bouncing through that, to uh, Latin mass Catholics. So within the Roman Catholic church, which is huge, you mentioned this too, there's so yeah. many of them. We were like, we think that we're the Christians. Protestants think that we're the Christians. No, we're not. And we're, we're, we're so small and tiny and, and immature and pathetic compared to Rome. They, they had so much more than we do in terms of just attendance and retention as well. I'm not saying that they're Orthodox, but I'm saying that we need to acknowledge how large they are. They're in their own battle right now internally over their own Orthodoxy, yeah. all centered around the Vatican II Council in the 1960s that got rid of the Latin Mass and did a couple other weird things to the point where, and I think this is fascinating, Pastor Coons. I recently, I mentioned this last week with, with Wolf Mueller. I was recently in a conversation with one of these guys and, and he, he's convinced convinced that the current pope isn't really the pope and he can't right. be because of certain uh, intra canonical rules of the of the cardinals and how things are done at, at the upper echelons uh, so there's this whole group that believes that that rome as a big church is semi apostate and that they need to retreat within rome they're not going to leave right. rome but within rome to preserve the real roman catholic church so that's a fascinating thing on its own Bringing this back to though, and we can chase those, but I, I really want to get into what's wrong with civilizational reclusion. And I'm going to say this uh, from, from my end here because I haven't read the Benedict Option. I don't know anything about yeah. this. I do know what I'm thinking about as a pastor of a semi-stable, but having to retreat from our original building because we can't mm -hmm. afford it, a semi-stable Lutheran confessing liturgical congregation in the middle of a very uh, politically liberal anti-Christian state, mm -hmm. Illinois, trying to think about how do, how do we stand firm as a congregation in what we believe for another 130 years? And the reason I have that thought is because we've been here 130 years. And so I want to – I can't as a man obviously make the church grow or anything stupid yeah. like that. But as the leader, 
as the, the, the father of the congregation, I must think about what it looks like. And the answer that is con continually kind of coming to my head or to our practice very slowly, but almost as if it's being done for us is something of a, um, a recognition that this congregation must be more than a club people go to on Sunday, but an actual human community that is established here. One that people might even want to move here to join because they know they will receive certain things on Sunday morning, but also be supported by Christians who want to live a Christian yeah. life yeah. here. That doesn't mean reclusion to me. So that may be the, the difference, but it does mean certain kinds of yeah. reclusion. Maybe we do live on the same blocks, that yeah. kind of thing. So is, is that what there's a problem with? And if so, I want okay. to know what. And if, if there's something different about the Benedict Option, then, then, then what's Yeah, that? the distinction I would make is that the Benedict Option is a long-term theological and political strategy, whereas some of the things that you are describing or individual choices that Christians or Christian congregations might make about where and how and by whom their children are educated, um, where and how and by what means they make money, um, things like that, that those would be tactical retreats. Um, a tactical retreat is for the purpose of a larger overall strategy. Um, the Benedict Option is a strategic retreat as well as a tactical retreat. So it's not just that you you buy contiguous land and you decide, well, we're going to support ourselves or we're, we're all going to agree to garden because otherwise we will be insecure and dependent on outsiders for food and they might refuse to feed us because we're Christians. You know, a lot of that stuff sounds, um, I think, wild to um, people that are accustomed to living in a, um, an officially Christian society. Uh, whether that's legally established or not. Um, but that stuff is all on the table if you look at persecution that Christians have gone through or are going through in other places. They will refuse to let you use bank accounts or online pay services. They might uh, take away your ability to support your family. So you want to be tactically secure uh, so that you don't have to put your, your family or your church through suffering. Um, I think that Christians understand this when we have misfortune in the congregation, we support one another. And I think that our thoughts about one another and our solidarity with one another will have to become much more intensive as time goes on. So there may be instances where we, we could have been engaged with the outside world 50 years ago, and now we're just going to have to make sure that we feed one another, as the Christians are doing, say, early on in the book of Acts, because nobody else will do it. Um, those are, those are tactical things. Um, Benedict is a, is an overall strategic thing. And I have, I have more to say about that, but it sounds like you want to respond a little bit. Well, maybe, um, cause I, I don't, I don't think that I don't have a strategy behind these tactics in my yeah. own head, at least it's not, it's, it, there is a, a bigger picture right. that I'm aiming for. I, I love the, the distinction between strategy and tactics, by the way. So I'm going to, I'm going to reemphasize this here because this is so important to congregational life because strategy is the, is the long-term war, right. right? You have a war, you right. need to win. Tactics are the battles. You got, you got some battles. You might have to lose some battles. Just kind of, they, they change battle, battle lines are drawn and then they don't work and you got to do other stuff. So in, in American Lutheran churches that I have served, I have often noticed that the tactics have become the strategy yep. and the congregation is more committed to their tactics than to their strategy. The strategy is the words of Jesus Christ and his holy mysteries, the sacraments being given to us that we might live. A tactic would be Sunday school, right? Right. right? And we, we are definitely more committed to Sunday school than to word and sacrament <laughs> ministry. There's no <laughs> question in my mind as a church body. That's just one example. <laughs> yeah. This is one of them. But that, that distinction is really important. It's important for life too. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of, of uh, what, what you might call tactical hacks, and uh, it's not just about business and entrepreneurship, but it's about how you manage time and all this kind of stuff. I love that stuff. So tactics mm -hmm. is great, but it always is empty without a strategy, without uh, something you're mm -hmm. aiming for. So I guess my first question is, well, shouldn't we also have a is – it, is it wrong to have an overarching strategy? No. Is that no, your problem? No, 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 not at all. I think we actually have – a strategy which does not involve which does not involve strategic retreat. 
that's my that's my issue there i have other critiques of the benedict option but let me just lay this out to start with um because this is kind of the ideological objection that i have i have historical objections too the ideological objection is this what you said about strategy is true the church already has a strategy it is divine and that is that the knowledge of the lord should fill the earth um, that strategy will require different tactics at different times in the same sense that the apostles had to know different tongues at different places and times to proclaim the one gospel, which goes out through all the earth, right? So in order for the life of Jesus to be made manifest through his body to the world, um, we have to be engaging with not only one another, but indeed the world with that message. So I don't think that retreat is ultimately strategically, that is, strategic retreat is not actually a faithful decision for a Christian church body to make, whether it's a family as a body of Christians or a congregation or what we usually say a church body like a synod, a denomination. That's not actually a faithful option because the strategy is already given that Jesus has come into the world, that the world might live through him. And for that to happen, the message has to sound through all the earth. So I'm, I'm having trouble imagining what a – with our distinction between strategy and tactics, what a strategic retreat even looks like. It, I don't know how you would have it. You would you can only have a tactical retreat. You can't – how can the strategy, the overarching strategy be retreat? That That's like just losing. Let's lose. Exa right? And that is – that is exactly – and that this is where this links up with my other critiques – uh, of Dreyer kind of generally is that one of the strategies that conservatives have adopted, especially since the 1950s, is basically to accept defeat gradually. So the way that you know what a conservative is, is you figure out what a liberal is saying today and you wait 20 years and you'll identify the conservative because he'll be saying what the liberal said 20 years ago. And that is the strategy that conservatives have adopted essentially in order, I think, to be tolerated because the announcement that progress is not in and of itself good or maybe even real is the heresy of our times. Uh, you must say that whatever is most recently pushed as valid, legitimate, good, whatever you must say that that is indeed valid, legitimate and good. If you do not, the conservative in modern American uh, politics, whether theological or otherwise, the conservative says, I'm sorry that I can't quite recognize that that is valid, legitimate and good. Please tolerate me anyway. Um, and so it, to me, it is a giant distraction from the issue. Um, the fact that there are, you know, good, wholesome families somewhere in Oklahoma um, just trying to go to church uh, is, you know, I... I, th those people need to protect themselves rather than apologizing for their existence. And I think that what Dreyer is doing, and he's been doing this since the book that I see is much more con in, in, in much greater continuity with Benedict Option, but many fewer, fewer people remember because it didn't really catch on, was Crunchy Cons, where he tried to talk about people who wore Birkenstocks and composted, but also wanted to defend their Second Amendment rights. And that was fine. And, and I myself both own guns and like to recycle. Um, so I think I might be the person he was trying to describe, but it was a, it was a strat his strategy is a strategy of appeasement. And I think the, the, the theological problem with that is that if you look at how Paul describes principalities and powers, or you see how voracious evil is in the Bible, you will not be tolerated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 what you're? I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around just the political side of this. So, so what you're saying is that Dreyer is effectively saying, "Let's play the middle." Yeah. Rather than say what we believe, let's play the middle, and that that as a strategy is to decide what we have to give is actually not good, mm -hmm. and that we need to lose in order to win, and that what's happened historically is, as the left has just said, we believe what we believe, and they keep pushing right. for their quote unquote right. progress. It's dragged the appeasement further left and really undone any actual conservative thought 
generally or holistically. That, yeah. But it's all because appeasement. Let is me say it this way, because it works the same way in the church. I mean, if the listener thinks that I'm just talking about secular politics, I'm not. This is a reality. This is a civilizational battle. It's not confined to it's not even identical with Democrats versus Republicans. OK, is that what the left does is they'll take something that is really heinous, like pedophilia. And you can see them doing this right now. They did the same thing with homosexuality in the 50s and 60s, starting with the McKinsey with the Kinsey report is first, they will simply suggest that something should be studied or discussed. Right. And it, it's probably something that that instinctively either people don't even know about. Right. There were a lot, there were plenty of people who didn't understand what homosexuality was when it was first being pushed. Right. Um, you know, largely through media. They didn't they didn't know what they were talking about. They just thought of that as perversion. Right. It wasn't a thing you could be, so to speak. So first they'll study or discuss it. And that especially is why academia has been so important to the left, because that gives it respectability when somebody with a bunch of degrees who is eloquent is talking about it in a rational manner. Right. If I can just calmly discuss, you know, cannibalism, then that makes it sound like maybe it's not as weird or instinctively repulsive or shouldn't be, you know, shot on sight uh, because I'm calmly discussing it. So you study. Yeah, with a with, with a right, British accent. Right. right. So you study or discuss it. And then eventually <clears throat> you form and you, you, you bring the interest group out into the open. And the interest group pushes, and, and in our civilization, the place that you're going to push, no matter what you do or who you are, is on concepts like freedom and rights and progress, because those are, those are touchstone words. And you're going to push on those, and you're going to come to suggest that the real problem is not that you are heinous or disgusting, it's that you are not being recognized for the rights or the freedoms that are due to you. Um, so then you push on those and then that's how you do it politically and also ideologically, whether through media or other means. And a lot of times you can get the church to go along with you because the church will get gaslighted because the church feels guilty that it's not giving you what is your due. Right. And um, it, it, you can especially push on the church wanting to be nice because the church has been taught, I don't think explicitly, but the church has been taught that the precondition for evangelism is being nice, not being truthful, right? right? So um, the, the church has come to believe that evangelism is premised on people liking you rather than people believing that what you're saying is true, which is the biblical premise, right? You have to be truthful biblically in order to evangelize, not necessarily nice. Niceness might be a tactic that you use in order to get access to people in the way that Paul tactically could be like a Jew to Jews or Greek to Greeks. But the strategy is always truthfulness about repentance and faith. So, um, so that's, so that's what you do. And, and the church will usually go along with you eventually and will feel bad about its own message. And then you can just take over. And once you take over, then you begin to enforce what is still called tolerance, but is really orthodoxy on everyone, right? So first you have to tolerate and then you have to uh, go along with what used to be merely tolerated. Now it's orthodoxy and if you don't believe it, you will be fired from your job, um, whatever, right? That, that's how it goes. This is, this is progress, this is this is how, orthodoxy. Yeah, this is, right? how, so, this is how, quote, progress works. And Richard John Newhouse, whatever his theological failings, recognized that this is what happens in churches too. First, heresy asks, asks for tolerance, and then heresy becomes the new orthodoxy, and then orthodoxy itself can no longer be tolerated even in the church. And the same thing happens right, in right, politics. Right. Yeah, give, give us a seat at the table. It's all we want. Oh, oh, we, we just want to vote. Oh, oh, can we chair the meeting? And no, you can't be at our table right. anymore. It's right. uh, yeah, over right. decades, over decades, right? over decades, over decades. And you can see the same thing with Francis in Rome is that if you read anything about Francis as a man, or you just observe what he does, if you follow Jesus's rule and you watch what people do more than what they say they're doing, you can observe that Francis himself is very ruthless. Uh, he will fire people. He only appoints people who will absolutely go along with what he's doing. Uh, the left usually is much more shrewd than the conservative or the orthodox. Uh, I don't I don't exactly know why that is, but the left is usually much more shrewd about how it markets itself and then also how it behaves in order to ensure its own grasp on power. And I think what's 
just a, just a little thing on the gaslighting thing. And then, and then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up for a second on the gaslighting thing is when the left brings up within the Lutheran church, Missouri synod, when it brings up the right, a phrase that it will constantly use as a phrase from the resolution, um, that synod, that synod made condemning higher, the higher critical method in the early 1970s. Um, and the phrase that we used is, is, um, basically just, uh, it, it's from the formula of Concord. It's a paraphrase, which is that the higher critical method, um, should not be taught, uh, sh should not be tolerated, much less taught in the churches of God, right? That there are things that simply you should not say if you're claiming to be speaking for the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And we said that. And they, they bring up that phrase as, look how intolerant and, and rude and, and whatever else the Missouri Synod was. It doesn't matter, you know, and, and, and they'll, they'll use that and they'll say, look, look, how, look how mean they were. Well, what the church was doing was the church was rejecting what was foreign and harmful to the body the same way I pull a splinter out of my child if it's in my child's finger. I'm not going to say, well, what you need to do is just get used to the pain and the infection, you know. That, that, that's your problem. You're not tolerant of infections. And indeed, a healthy body is intolerant of infections. But what they're going to do is they're going to they're going to put the splinter in your body and then they're going to make you feel bad that you don't like the splinter. That's what they do. So you made a jump to Missouri Synod 1970s, which I, I think is valuable. But maybe for for those of us who haven't had all the pieces yeah. tied together, Getting from 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 uh, Francis and the Jesus rule to higher critical theory in the seventies is is a long mm -hmm. way to go, especially because I, I don't even know what the Jesus rule is. So that's this is the the school that Francis subscribes to within Roman Catholicism. Is no, the G Jesus's rule is you know think about the Sermon on the Mount where you observe trees not just by you know l let's say what the trees say they are, but you observe them by their fruit. So when someone is doing something, when you know, oh, you, you, you need yeah, to observe you. not just what he's saying or whether or not he says it in a nice voice. And, and I observe this constantly is that um, people will tell you anything to be nice, or maybe they'll just tell you nothing at all in order to be nice. It's much more important to observe what they're actually doing so that you can tell, you know, right. And <clears throat> so, so Francis speaks softly and carries always, a big stick always, and... always. He's such a, he's such a nice guy. He's so understanding. He's so compassionate, blah, 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 blah. Well, if you don't agree with him, he will cut your head off, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so, okay. Man, you, you said so many good things there and I, I don't, I don't know which one to chase. I'm hung up though on this key, continues to come yeah. back to me that appeasement, appeasement is the strategy of, of the loser. Yeah. And that the, however we want to define left and right that the, the, the left mind is it certainly doesn't believe in no. appeasement and the, and that the right mind, whether politically conservative or, or uh, biblically conservative does. And that this, this is the bigger problem. The problem is not the Benedict option. Then the problem is that the Benedict option is also infused with this continued belief that appeasement is the correct. Path to if we just, if we just right. go away somewhere, they will let us exist. Right, right. So France and Belgium and then Britain in 19, you know, 1930s, right? It, it's, <laughs> that, that was their strategy, right? Appeasement. They even they yeah. called it that. And it, it did not work. Hitler kept coming. And not, not that everybody on the left is Hitler or anything silly like that. But what, what Hitler did was believed he was right, even though he was insane, he believed he was right. And so he just kept going. He just kept doing what he thought he should do. And so what you're really advocating here is that Whatever we do as Christians, tactically on the ground, whatever decisions we make, we must believe. Huh, this is so silly. We must believe we're right. <laughs> yeah. We must believe yeah. that we have the real religion. Well, it's interesting as I, I you know, I, I was uh, doing a little new members work yesterday. Uh, we've talked about this before. I, I'm finally not just doing new members individually. I've got two together mm -hmm. because just time. I just right. can't do it. Um, but. Uh, is interesting as I'm talking, like I'm, I'm trying to, to lay a foundation. So the first meeting was about how you got to know that everything that I talk about from this point on is under the assumption that the Bible's true. And then uh, to, yesterday's one was 
the Jesus has risen from mm-hmm. the dead, and that therefore that makes Christianity the only true religion. And it's interesting how even as I'm saying this to two people who are there because they, at least in theory, want to join the church, right? They're coming out of their way to be catechized mm-hmm. by me. I'm nervous to talk about how this is the one true religion, not because I don't believe it, but because I'm concerned that that will be the thing that they can't stomach. Right. And there's there's in me a, an inclination to soft serve the word on that matter, not to not say it, but to like couch it in the best possible, most tolerant and understanding terms, right? right? Uh, so that I can I can win them over. And that this so this is why I want to go back to Benedict Option and and reclusion because I, I I think that's what's really interesting. But but this issue of appeasement seems to be the real issue. It's it's not about just the Benedict option. It's it's a much huger issue. And it is that we don't really believe what we say is as valuable as winning people over to join right. us. And I think that that has two really deleterious effects on the body of Christ. One is that I don't know what uh, it, it hurts you. It hurts you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. Uh, is that on the one hand, it makes the body more concerned about how it might be doing something wrong uh, than it needs to be. So the church, when it when it when it goes into reclusion, and you know this about any group that isolates itself long enough, and you see the same dynamic if you look at the early history of the Perry County Lutherans and their attempt to just kind of escape is that when people are alone together, they begin to fight with each other. When they have no common outward purpose, they just scream at each other. And you can afford to do that as long as you are not being attacked from the outside. But the church Mm -hmm. cannot afford to do that when it is being attacked from the outside. So if I disagree with another LCMS guy on one-year lectionary versus three-year lectionary, I will not tell any outsider about why I think that guy is wrong. Because one, it doesn't matter. And two, it's not going to help anything. The, the behavior of eating our own is something that the church can only do as long as someone else is not trying to eat us. We're, we, we can live under the illusion that somehow eating our own is natural and good and fine because, you know, nobody else is attacking us. The other, the other problem is that then we also get obsessed with ourselves and our own inner dynamics and our own inner strife. And we no longer carry the message confidently outward because we don't even think about it because we spend most of our time thinking about what's going on inside the body and how bad everyone inside the body is. And I think you see this on the right um, politically where the right is the first to condemn one another. Um, they'll 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 rush to a microphone to condemn each other for saying something that is out of line or whatever the left doesn't do that the left doesn't condemn its own kind of nut jobs and it's not that they don't police their own nut jobs they obviously i mean they were really worried about what bernie was saying so the super delegates made sure that hillary got the nomination but but hill right, but hillary right. didn't come out and condemn what bernie was saying in strict terms um that, that's not how they do it and so Tactically, they're much more adept generally than the right is because the right eats its own as as the church often does. Well, so so I, initially I, I conceived of you as talking about the Missouri Synod and its political realities. Uh, I don't know, as, as long as I've known it, which is since the, the late 90s. But then, you know, yeah, jumping to the, the political spectrum, it makes sense. I guess what interests me is the Missouri Synod mm-hmm. as a reclusion reality, not just from from Perry County, the south end of uh, St. Louis yeah. area where they had originally settled, but the ongoing kind of insular mind. And I, I don't know how best to, to open this as a, as a concept, but uh, it, we talk about the Missouri Synod as if it were the church, not because we aren't in the one church, but we talk about it as if the church rises or falls with the Missouri Synod when aside from being rather arrogant, it's just, it's, it's foolishness. It's like a, my, my three-year-old or my five-year-old thinking that they're actually a superhero when they're standing beside an actual superhero. <laughs> and I don't want to besmirch. I think I, I'm in the Missouri Synod because I believe that what we have confessionally is Christianity yeah. and nothing right. but, but then that's not what we're talking about. 
and not, certainly not what we're fighting over. Uh, what, what we fight over is, like you said, on, on the right eats its own. We fight over nuances and we, we take dogmatic stances on them. And then the left, uh, so far as I can understand it, is fighting against anything that would be conservative, confessional, liturgical, for the sake of, I don't know, honestly, um, which may, brings me a little bit to as you're talking. So, so what's the left politically actually after? Who's the who's the, who's behind the hive mind in any of this, or is it all just random need to rebel and take things to the edge? Uh, the zeitgeist of the time is that we must change, so let's yeah. do it. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's not just Karl Marx at right. work. It's, it can't just be that. so. Yeah. Know, so make sure that I that I actually talk about. I want to talk about the left, and then, but I also want to talk about the Missouri Synod and, and how, we, and how we think about it. Um, the left, I, I, I think if you don't learn anything else from the Bible, you should at least learn that, um, evil is personal. And, um, so that, so that societal changes, um, things that people say, things that people think, things that people end up believing. It's not like the weather. It's not like there's nothing you can do about it, or you can't think anything. I mean, if it's raining outside, it doesn't matter how much I think about whether or not it should be or is sunny. That doesn't make it sunny. But the things that people believe and take to heart and live out are not like the weather. Um, those are things that uh, people believe because someone has told them or someone has modeled those things for them. The left um, does not have to have a single human agency um, because that's 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 not how movements work. Uh, but it does. But when someone is telling you that good is evil and evil is good, that does have a a personal agency in Satan. So if someone is telling you that you know um, an unborn child is just a fetus, uh, that is evil, and it is personally evil. Um, that's that's not just the weather. That's not just well, times have changed. I mean, this kind of resignation that well, times have changed. Well, times have changed before. There was a time when pedophilia was normal in the Roman Empire, and then there was a time when it wasn't. And that wasn't just the weather. That was that was people changing their beliefs because Christians were saying children are children and are not sexual objects, which I think we're going to have to be very clear about going forward now. So I think to look at s historical change is just that's, you know, things just change or, you know, my life is different than my, I live vastly differently from my grandparents to, you know, times have just changed. That's not how this actually works. There's a lot more agency involved in history and what people believe than I think a lot of us think, because we're just taught there's this just wave of progress sweeping us all into an unknown future, which will, we are assured, be the best of all possible worlds. Well, as long as you have synthesis, right? <laughs> as long as Hegel, as long as Hegel's right. right. To, to, to drop a bomb, you know, that may not be understood, but the, the, I'm not going to chase it either. So the, I, I still, it, it's almost like uh, John Birch Society, and maybe you're a card carrying no. member. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. No. I'm not. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I can understand being concerned about those who have lots of money and power and stay uh, out of the main site uh, running things because they want to keep their money and power. Yeah. I get that. But I think uh, more valuable is is what you just said, that that Satan is a personal right. demigod who, who's alive, thinking, active, doesn't right. sleep, and works through words that he, uh, he twists and has pushed into our flesh. So they actually come out of us without him having to necessarily tell us to. And that yet he can, he can so, he is actively so deceptive, forming strongholds of these lies that he can move agendas through history. Right. So the idea of the zeitgeist by itself to me, the time ghost, Satan is the time ghost. He is, he's behind history, not over but it, behind it. Yeah, but right. in it, right. but in it. And so the spirit of every age is his spirit. And, and the question is, how is he using that spirit at this time to deflect and destroy what God has said never right. changes? Right. What God had said is the truth. Right. Yeah. We don't, we don't, I mean, we don't, we don't have to go Bircher and find, well, who funded this and who did that? Because what I'm talking about is much simpler than that. When you see an advertisement that shows um, two gay men and quote, their baby, you know, it's a lie because you know that one of those men 
could couldn't have birth that child. So there's a mother hidden somewhere off stage that is not in that quote relationship or quote marriage. That 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 picture in and of itself of romantic love producing a child with two men is itself a lie. You have to realize that you are not being told the truth much of the time and increasingly less of the time, but you are still being talked to. Um, so you, you have to look at lies as personal realities and not just a kind of anonymous process of change that you either accept or if you can't accept it or won't accept it because your church teaches differently, then you at least apologize for not accepting it, which is. Well, that's, that's getting back to right. the appeasement. So let's, let's leave that alone and, just, and stick with that. The personal lies are being told by persons yeah. And that there there is a mind behind it all, even if you can't follow the money. And you don't have to. Yeah, you don't, it should, doesn't matter. No, yeah. no. And we should just acknowledge that. That's what we that's what we confess and believe is the case. And we even believe that he is most active ha, in the Roman Catholic uh, hierarchy. Go figure. Um, so that's, that's a, uh, again a conversation for another time. You wanted to make sure that you defined, and this is this is fair. So when we say the yeah. left in the Missouri Synod. Does that even exist? No, I mean, the no. Missouri Synod left is pro-life. Yeah, exactly. Right? No, theory, no, and, and the things that I've been saying about the left don't actually apply to our church body because I think that as much as our church body needs to discuss and refine and uh, care about its own theology and practice, what we're talking about civilizationally does not concern our church body because, because by some incredible providence of God, we did actually pull the splinter out. We, we no, think, I, 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 well, I don't, really I don't think forever and ever, amen. But I do think that what occurred in the LCMS in the 1970s, uh, where we actually upheld the Bible, contrary to the direction we were, at, we were swimming in ourselves, is mm -hmm. an amazing thing, legitimately. It is. I think it is such that uh, it's a stunning and right. impossible thing such that when I'm talking about the left, I am not talking about because because if if you sincerely believe that progress is more important than truth, whatever progress means, whatever you've been taught that it means right now, because progress had nothing to do with transgenderism 10 years ago. And now you are a, you are a tra you are a transphobic if you do not affirm that right away. Right. The creed on the left continues to grow. Right. That does that is not currently, at least a reality within our church body. When I'm talking about our church body, my interest is more in what do we And you said we think we are the church. And let me be clear about this, because when I first became a Lutheran, I read CFW Walther's Law and Gospel. And then the next thing that I read by Walther, because I was very interested, was a set of essays called The True Visible Church of God Upon Earth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is about mm -hmm. the evangelical Lutheran church, the church that maintains the confession uh, uh, and subscribes to the Book of Concord of 1580, which is in accordance with the scriptures. Um, that church is, you know, uh, could be the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Um, if Missouri had broken a different way in the 70s, it wouldn't be anymore and it would have to be something else. So it's not exactly the same thing as a denomination, but it is identifiable by its confession. And the job of the Missouri Synod is to maintain its confession for that reason, so that it continues actually to be that church which confesses that doctrine and practices that practice, which the Lord has revealed to us in the scriptures and which is explicated in the confessions. And that's what Walther's talking about. Now, I think that that was not intended to make us insular in the least. And that's why we did this episode on Word Fitly Spoken about what I call the forgotten age of the Missouri Synod, which is roughly its second quarter century, roughly. A little longer, you know, maybe extending into the 1920s. But what I'm saying with that is that what actually happened with Missouri is that our conviction that what we were doing and saying was actually biblical, that conviction drove us outward in confidence rather than inward in recrimination. That if you are actually, if you're actually believing, teaching, and confessing what the scriptures say and what is expounded in the Lutheran confessions, that drives you in confidence in who Christ is 
into all the earth. And that's actually what we did. I mean, especially with home missions, we went ever, I mean, the reason, the reason that the Missouri Synod is so much bigger than the Wisconsin Synod, even though we had the exact same confession at that time, right? We were in fellowship with each other. Why is Missouri so much bigger? There are different historical factors you could identify. I think the driving theological factor was the Missourians exhibited a certain attitude of confidence about themselves and their church body and what they had to offer that pushed them into every part of the country, which Wisconsin did not. And I, I mean, that's I'm taking that from Wisconsin Synod discussion of the issue. We were simply very confident, not arrogant, but confident. And I think that that, that certainty about I'm telling you the truth is both very convincing to people, but it's also motivating to those who are saying it. It, it reminds me of a story that <clears throat> I learned uh, from President Harrison before he was president at a com uh, conference on Wynikin uh, in, mm -hmm. in Baltimore. Wynikin, the second president of the Synod, who was a missionary in Baltimore, Baltimore. and he was known for literally buttonholing people, <laughs> right. which is that he'd be seen on the street with his finger through the buttonhole of a guy's <laughs> coat so that he had him by the neck, basically, in his <laughs> face – telling him about Jesus salvation and right. the Lutheran church and how you're going to hell if you don't join us. And, and like, it was quite yeah. effective, frankly, uh, he, he was known for this and for his zeal and, and, but he was not known for being arrogant yeah. or rude or, or cruel or yeah. anything like that. He just really was convinced yeah. of this. And there's something to be envied about that. Now I want to, I want to get back to Benedict, but pit stopping still here in, in yeah. Missouri and coming out of the, Seminary in Exile, 1970s, Battle for the Bible, vote to kick the false teaching out, which we didn't actually follow through on. So it stayed, particularly in certain districts and certain uh, pastors. While that may not quite be a, a dominant uh, political mm -hmm. issue in, in Missouri mm -hmm. today, I, I'm not convinced mm -hmm. it's not. I think it's morphed. But, but, but that's separate than – what you described about how the progressive in uh, political situations in America is unapologetic for their position, mm -hmm. is unwilling to critique its oh. own, and is rather um, vicious in how it actually carries right. out its mission as opposed to the right that doesn't right. do any of that and is trying to be nice and placate and play the middle and appease. That is very much the way that – I see the progressive Missouri Synod, which isn't about abortion and uh, transgenderism, but it is about leaving behind the confessions as historical documents that really don't apply to us. It, it is about leaving behind the, the liturgy as something we are free to give or take and make up on our own, be, however we like, embracing revivalism. Uh, and, and I think to some extent it is about leaving behind the Bible, not by saying the Bible is untrue, but by – uh, bringing a new hermeneutic to how we read the scriptures, to, to what the texts are used for and how they're used, uh, kind of an end around yeah. on the whole thing. And quite quite direct and, and viciously so, I, I think. Maybe I'm wrong because they're all nice guys. They're all really nice guys. But then when they actually are in charge, they don't invite you to the table. Okay. Right? Yeah. And, and the right does. So this, this is still here. And, and is it about the conservative mind, meaning the one who wants to hold to the truth, has has swallowed this idea that to hold to the truth, we must apologize for the truth, whereas those who are – I don't think they're anti-truth in the Missouri Synod, but they're not about holding to the truth as past confessed. Somehow they've unleashed themselves from that need to apologize. <laughs> Uh, even though their whole movement to some extent is to force the church to apologize for being the church by having to look like okay. the world, which is kind of ironic, I guess, if you yeah. look at it that way. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm wrong in all of that, but I find it – I find yeah. it fascinating. I, I mean I mm. <clears throat> I just got back from speaking at a pastor's conference and um, I, I, I know that um, – I know that some of the things that I said, I was talking about imitation and Paul and how that pertains to a variety of issues in congregational life. I, I know that some of the things I was saying um, based on the questions the brothers were asking was challenging to some of them. Um, I wasn't trying to be, you know, rude or something, but it, they definitely were struggling with some of the stuff I was saying. I think that the distinction as far as operation goes is that 
there are times when brothers, when families have to work things out. They do that as a family and they have to do that on the basis of truth. They can't, they can't do it just on the basis of what feels okay or what, what, makes the conflict go away. They have to suss out the truth. They have to figure out what the truth is and how they're going to deal with that collectively, but they have to do it collectively. Um, I think a lot of times um, the, the option that guys take as parish pastors is that we all do what is right in our own eyes, and, but we simultaneously and, and often silently despise the brother for doing differently, but we never discuss it, which is to treat him as a stranger and not as a brother. There are times when Paul, for instance, has to reject things flatly out of hand. Um, those times also have to be dealt with. But I think that silence and not talking about difficult things will never enable us to reach concord. Um, I, I want to say that in my own experience, um, I have been more the recipient of suspicion from brothers Um than I, than I, I, I mean, I, I try really hard not to operate on suspicion with brothers because I partly just teaching at a public university as I have been, I, I don't see the brother who, you know, um, isn't wearing vestments as all that different for me in the whole scheme of things from, you know, the kid who just kind of hates Christianity uh, altogether that's in my religion class ranting about it. So it's, it, it's kind of a perspective thing in that way. But I, I think that, I think that when we're dealing with each other, um, the, the thing to, to, to kind of harp on is, um, brothers are able to discuss strangers are not, but discussion has to happen. And I think a lot of times it just doesn't. Yeah, this is where I mean, we ought to be able to to uh, uh, apply what you just said to the actual Baptist, the actual Methodist, the actual yeah. Papist, and, and 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 treat them that way. What I guess I think is going on in Missouri is that we can't even admit that we have two different church bodies trying to work as one church body. We have two different confessions of, I think it's sacramentology. They do not deny the presence of Jesus Christ in the bread and wine, but they do not believe it is sufficient to convert. They need music to convert and they put their, their hope and their trust in Finney's new measure. And that is a sacramentology. Uh, it is a, a soteriology as well. And that, that is fellowship dividing in my mind. So it's not so much that I distrust the brother just because I don't like right. him or yeah, anything right. like that, but I, we haven't been able to get to the point where they can admit their own position. I don't think they would accept what I just said. And they'll say, no, we're really united. It reminds me of there was this vote under Kishnik, uh, in synod, actual synod vote of uh, uh, to affirm that we are united mm -hmm. as synod. And it passed by 51%. Mm -hmm. 49 voted against it. So so we – by 51%, we're united. We Shut oh, up. Don't argue. Yeah. <laughs> right? And, 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 and until we can get to the point I – mean, and this is what you're saying. Until we cease fearing each other and recognize this isn't to say you're not a Christian. It's to say I think you're heterodox and you think I'm heterodox. And you know what? One of us is. But we're not going to figure that out if we can't talk about it and if we just hide and shoot and try to win power so we can preside over the collapse of Concordia system or, or whatever, you know, yeah. whatever we're trying to, to run. Um, yeah. So, OK, that's 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 its own interesting topic. We're, we're at 53 <laughs> minutes here and I want to respect your time um, and I want to I want to come back and at least try to close on on Benedict yeah, sure. inclusionism here. Because, because so so your issue with the Benedict option as as proposed by Rod Dreyer is largely that we should not adopt a strategy of appeasement rather we should adopt a strategy of uh, what was the word maybe not not so much aggression confident, but of, confident um, proclamation of the gospel yeah. yes i want to put that yeah i completely yeah. agree with you i just i'm looking for like as opposed to appeasement i guess confidence is is, is yeah. what it is um certainty uh solidarity uh, those yeah, which is which is founded on Christ. I mean, the church, the church that that is so so fruitful in martyrs is not a church which is running away. It is a church which is solid in itself. They support one another even to death. They will die with one another, and it is a church which is confident that it that it is saying the truth, which is for the benefit of mankind. That's the church that converts the Roman Empire. It's not a church which apologizes for itself. 
You, you just got it there with, okay, so so we want to reject the strategy of appeasement and adopt the strategy of martyrdom with everything that that yeah. word means yeah. from confident witness to death right. because of right. the confident because, witness. And, that that yeah. is the strategy. Yeah. I, I remember uh, you know learning about uh, certain policies in certain church bodies that we may or may not have talked about in the last five minutes uh, with regards to missionaries in the field who, whenever there is a threat to life, are pulled out of mm -hmm. the missionary field. Uh, that is to prevent mm -hmm. martyrdom. And thinking, wow, that's different and maybe backwards. Um, so, so that is, that is a thing. Okay. So with the Benedict option, then having, uh, had this discussion, if the concepts, the, the tactics in the Benedict option were put into a strategy of martyrdom, would you be more comfortable with the, the concept of the Benedict option? Because I think, I think most people who are like, you got to read this. This yeah. is really cool. They're excited yep, about the tactics. Sure I, I don't think they're excited about the, the strategy. Right, right. And I and I don't think they're thinking. I I, I think my background in um, conservative conservative thought and publishing um, influences this because I've just I've seen it so many times and I know what Dreyer is doing and I know it doesn't work. I know that they will not listen to you no matter how many times you apologize for disagreeing. It doesn't make it better. You either fall in line with progress or you get run over. And um, I would rather that we be prepared to to witness to Christ, um, even to death, which is actually what we ask people to do when they join our congregations. Will you remain steadfast in this church and confession even to death, suffering all rather than fall away from it? I mean, I, what I like about the church um, is that we remember things um, that come from far outside and and much before our own time and context. So the church has the church has flourished in sexually insane societies before. The church has been fruitful in martyrs and fruitful in proclaiming the gospel in persecution and is right now in many cases uh, and has done before. I mean, I'm I'm confident and optimistic because I know Christ and what he has done with his body before. So I'm not anxious about the future. I'm confident that Christ will do what is good and and best for his body. I mean, he's ruling over all things for the good of his body, the church. Like, I actually believe that. And I want to I wanted to get in because we were talking about confidence is that when I was a um confused Episcopalian. I was reading the Bible and it was conflicting with what I was learning. And I was also, you know, I was at a very liberal college and I saw my church agreeing with what my college was teaching. And I saw those things as fundamentally destructive of life, um, spiritually, and, and sometimes also literally physically in, in what people were allowed to do with their lives and how it was killing them. Um, when I sent an email to the local Missouri Senate pastor and he came and, 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 and he also, he, I can't tell you how impactful it was. And, and the, the man's name is Charles St. Ange. He's in Canada now. He came to me. I mean, I didn't have a car. So he came to me and he wasn't arrogant, but he was like, you know, I'm going to tell you the truth from the Bible. I mean, that was amazing to me, you know, because nobody was telling me the truth and I could see how lies were working out for other people. So that is, um, if you're listening to this and you're kind of like, wow, this is kind of crazy. That changes people's lives when you can actually talk to somebody and he's like, I'm going to tell you the truth. Um, that's awesome. And um, most people don't have that. So I think that if the church knows that it has that, um, it has the actual gospel, it, it, ha it worships the true God, um, nothing can stop us. The gates of hell don't prevail against us. Not to turn the topic too quickly away from the, the blessed Charles St. Ange. A uh, friend of mine as well. Uh, was Benedict of Mercia an no, appeaser? No, no. Was his strategy? No, no. And the book is man? historically wrong because the thing that Dreyer ignores is that the the various the various kingdoms, the the various regional kingdoms that replace the Western Empire, are what hold back the Muslims from conquering Europe. They succeed in conquering Spain because Spain is divided. Um, and the church um, also capitulates in some places. Um, and when the church capitulates, people leave the church. Sounds familiar. Um, but in much of the West, especially in what becomes France and Italy and um, the various German lands, 
Um, the rulers and the church are united against the physical onslaught of Islam, and they keep the splinter away from them. They, they, they don't even get the splinter pushed into their skin. And eventually in Spain, they take the splinter out after 700 years. How does how does Benedict's tactics impact that or does Benedict? It? Does it I mean, yeah, I mean, it, I think if you study anything about medieval history, I mean, the monasteries have a huge role in preserving texts and learning, but they do that also in the East where the Muslims do not um, expand to nearly the same degree for for a much longer time. So Benedict and and Monte Cassino and the Benedictines and then other monastic orders have a huge role in preserving learning and um, even uh, I'm I, I love to garden. They have a, they have a role in preserving certain styles of gardening and certain you know plants. Uh, so they're awesome, but they weren't single handedly preserving Western civilization. Is it accidental that a primary tactic of Benedict then? And also of the Benedict option, even though it's strategy, we're, we're going to go ahead and say a strategy is wrong. Is it accidental that it revolves around a collegium, a, a school for teaching uh, adults to think? No, not at all. Because, um, and, and I don't think Benedict actually was exercising the Benedict option. Let me be clear. I think, I think that what yeah, he yeah. was doing was seeking to preserve for the sake of the larger church um, a garden of learning um, and a retreat uh, for a time um, for the greater good of the church, that is a tactic in the same way that our church body has seminaries where men go away from, you know, having to, uh, you know, repair HVAC systems or program computers or whatever they were doing before they were there. And they spend an intensive period of learning and seminary means seedbed. And they do that for the greater and longer term good of the church. Retreat is necessary. Jesus retreats sometimes, but only tactically. So, and with that, I mean, seminary, mm -hmm. fine and good. Um, I'm thinking like, so you mentioned these other, these Roman Catholic Latin yeah. mass communities, and then you named a couple of colleges yeah. that are doing this. And I do not think the Concordia system is prepared for anything like this, by the way. But I, I – so I'm going to throw it all out here, right? Here, here is what I am planning, God so help me. Provided that I, I remain alive, the Lord willing, and that uh, I remain faithful to the church, mm -hmm. the Lord willing, and that I am not called away to another field uh, from this place, uh, the Lord willing. My, my, my desire is to so convince – the congregation in the centrality of the word and sacraments of Jesus Christ as being life itself, that we begin to intentionally colonize this area of Rockford, mm -hmm. Illinois. Not that we would retreat. We want to put a sign up saying, here's where you find us. And then we want to go forward. We want to uh, hostily but beneficially take over the intellectual climate of a defunct and failing city within a defunct and failing state where there is no successful college. And I want the, the growth of this mind to then intentionally plant and create a place to draw young men, particularly mm -hmm. to learn how to think as men and as mm -hmm. Christians, not so that we can send them off somewhere else in the world to work, but so that we can continue to be good citizens here for the sake of neighbor, but also for the sake of, the fact that we have at the center of us an unwavering commitment to the word and sacraments of Jesus Christ in this place to stand firm on that, regardless of whatever else yeah. may come. Now, I don't have an actual uh, tactical plan to get there, right? a little <laughs> one, but but it's 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 not real. This is a pipe dream, right? But what I what I'm looking for is for you to tell me, and I think I think you have. That's not the Benedict option because you're not trying to appease anyone. You're actually trying to simply establish a, a, a local – not permanent. You can't say permanent. Lord willing, yeah. permanent, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Congregation that is more than just a German club but is in fact a community of Christians devoted to the three estates in the yeah. place where they are and, and believing that there's not going to be 15 of these in every city in America. That if we're going to be church 100 years from now, we have to kind of 
do this mm -hmm. um, a little bit on purpose. Maybe not all live on the same block, but we got to we got to live together somehow. Right. Right. And, and act together. Is, is that is that crazy? No, talk? Uh, no that's just... great. No, as long as you know, you won't be left alone. And I, oh, I yeah. think that's the oh. thing that always breaks my heart about the Amish is that they 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 think extremely intentionally about preserving their own way of life and their own and how they function and getting along with each other and everything. But if they were in some kind of civilizational um, turning kind of situation, such as the church lived through at the at the end of the unified Western Empire. The Amish would just be run over because they will not defend themselves. So I think as long as you know that you will not be left alone, go for it. Do whatever you need to do to preserve the body of Christ and to extend it. So and and, and with with that, as you just said that at the end, you know, it is about defending it. The goal the goal is to stand firm where you are that others might stand mm -hmm. firm after you. And, and the, the results of that have to just be left to Jesus. Right. Uh, and to some extent, even getting there has to be left to Jesus. I just don't think we can go on not thinking this way yep. anymore, that somehow we're just going to have this huge swath of uh, Germans decide they want to keep Lutheranism alive and come in and start paying for this institutional Goliath that we have we have mounted for ourselves, it's it it's not real. Yeah. So, but I want my kids to go to right. church when I'm not mm -hmm. here anymore, right? Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, good stuff, Adam. Thank <laughs> yeah, my you. pleasure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Did, did we? Did you get to say everything about the benedictine? <laughs> yeah, last sure. Question? I mean, I I I mean, we could do a chapter by chapter review, but yeah, I'm good. Yeah, no, I, I think I think that was good. I'd love to. What what where I want to where I see this interesting now is is how I just don't think that most people who are talking about it are even thinking about it on the level you're thinking about it. And then you got to be careful how we say it then, so that they get what the problem right. is, and don't think you're just saying you Correct. shouldn't. Um, and I think and, yeah, and I think right? that that this is just part of the the broader point about treating one another as brothers. Like when I'm talking about mission that makes certain brothers uncomfortable because it's not something they always think about. And when I'm talking about the Benedict option, I don't want to just, you know, unintentionally enrage some brother who is well-intentioned, loves his family, wants to keep things going and just, you know, likes Rod Dreher or whatever, you know, in, in everything, I mean, gentleness with other people that you may have to die with. I think taking the martyrdom perspective is huge. If you're willing to die with this man, don't scream in his face today and potentially never be able to speak hmm. to him. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Don't fight in right. the foxhole. Right. right? Yeah. Uh, do that later. Yeah. Do that right. later when the war's over, you know, or something. <laughs> and, and this, and this right. war ain't over until, uh, until right. the Lord returns. Uh, thank you, Adam, for, for joining me. Uh, we'll get to Ezekiel. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah.